I would like to believe in God, but religions, a world thick with them, trouble me. Religions contradict and compete, and that's a problem for those who believe or want to believe. That's my problem. If there is a God, and if God works through religion, how can religions disagree so deeply? Sometimes so violently. So profound are conflicts among religions that atheists revel that all religions should be rejected. But some believers claim the reverse, that many religions show the pervasive power of spiritual pursuit, that many religions at their core reflect the same transcendent reality. In searching for God, do religions complement or contradict? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. I can go for the atheistic argument that religious diversity means religious bankruptcy. The challenge is for believers who pretty much believe their religion is the right religion. So how on earth could competing religions ever complement one another? I go to Birmingham, England, to meet a philosopher who converted, quite literally, from an evangelical Christian into a world-renowned pluralist who seeks to validate all major religions, John Hick. John, I see such contradictions between religions, it's impossible for them all to be real, and therefore, how could any of them be real? What are contradictory? Are their doctrines, their beliefs, aren't they? Well, that seems to be pretty important. But what are their beliefs about? You see, the general assumption is their beliefs about ultimate reality. But I would say they're not. That their beliefs about the way in which we are perceiving reality within our own tradition. So actually they don't contradict one another because their awareness is of different things. Well, the only thing that you can say they have in common is they have an ultimate. Right. And that ultimate is a transcendent ultimate beyond the physical world. Yes. But right. that's where you stop because after that they are directly contradictory. Yes, well that's correct, yes. That disturbs me but doesn't disturb you quite as much. Not quite as much, no. <laughs> I can put up with, with facts when I'm presented with them, and it is a fact that within different traditions, the transcendent, the ultimate, is very differently thought about and experienced. And why not? That's okay. You talk about the difference between naive realism mm. and critical realism. Yeah. Naive realism says that things are just as we perceive them. If I see something as solid, it is solid. Critical realism acknowledges that there is a human contribution that enables us to interpret the clues of experience. When I look at you, I assume that there's a back of your head as well as the front that I can see. Now, how does that apply to the obvious contradictions between the father of Jesus and the Allah of Islam and then the cosmic consciousness of, uh, of Buddhism mm. and the uh, different gods in the Hindu religion? Well, a naive realist would say of each of these that it is, that it is itself real and therefore contradictory. Yes. But the critical realist will say that just as the human mind is at work in sense perception, so also it is in uh, our religious awareness. So that what, what we are describing in each case is the way in which the transcendent appears uh, through the lens of that particular tradition. And so there's no contradiction in the fact that different traditions provide different lenses uh, leading to different uh, sets of doctrines. And it, it is no degradation of the ultimate, of the real, as you've called it, to have itself interpreted in all these 
bizarre ways? No, I don't. Why should there be? Well, if the real is so real and so powerful, you'd think you'd be able to interpret it in at least consistent ways. Well, each of these ways is consistent. But uh, the real, no, I mean, to, to, to call the real powerful or weak is to use a set of terms which don't apply to it. This dichotomy simply doesn't apply. John's pluralistic hypothesis is that the bedrock of reality, what he calls the real, is the foundation of all religions, which are, as institutions, culturally conditioned human responses to the real. But most clerics are convinced that their own religion is the only true religion. So while the pluralistic hypothesis may provide a neat solution to the conflict, it is a solution that almost no one accepts. And even if there were an ultimate real, why then a smorgasbord of religious cultures cluttering it all up? Yet the pluralistic hypothesis is important and deserves analysis. I meet the co-director of the John Hick Center for Philosophy of Religion at the University of Birmingham, Eugen Nagazawa. So the pluralistic hypothesis says that there is only one thing, one supernatural entity, which is sometimes called the real, with a capital R. And uh, different religions, they seem to be talking about completely different things, but actually they are talking about the exact same thing, the real. And I think there's something right about this hypothesis, but there is something wrong as well. <laughs> what is right about it is that, after all, religions are religions. So they are interested in more or less the same thing. They're interested in uh, the existence of some supernatural entity and the meaning of life, uh, the origin of morality, and so on. But if we construe their religious claims as metaphysical or ontological claims, we cannot say that they talk about the exact same thing. For example, Buddhism says that there is no God. Hinduism says that there are many gods. And Christianity says there is one God. <laughs> so they cannot be all true. I mean, it is possible that all of them are false, but it cannot be true that all of them are true. It would seem that if there is a real, that even the concept of God it can't be the lowest common denominator. I mean, if there is the real, that should be beyond our imagination. So you might think that it's impossible to grasp it or describe it. But still, we want to say something about it. For example, the real is ultimate reality, or it's the greatest possible being. It sounds like it makes everybody feel good to have all the religions be somewhat true. But if one wants to access ultimate truth, it would seem that the contradictions overwhelm any sort of commonality. I want to think that philosophy can help here. So when different religions make conflicting claims, we can do metaphysics or we can appeal to science as well. And we, have, we can find out which claim is more plausible than the other. Maybe it's not impossible to underst fully understand what the real is, but we can still progress our, uh, our knowledge of the real. And, and so what do you do with one god, many gods, and no god? We have to start the definition of the real. If you regard the real as the greatest possible being, then probably there is only one real. But that real may not have the personal characteristics that the Judeo-Christian Islamic God would have. That's yes. not a common denominator. Here we have to um, provide arguments for and against the existence of a personal God. Maybe a non-personal being is greater than a personal being. In that case, we'd be inclined to accept the non-personal concept of God. But maybe you have a better argument to show that the real has to be personal. Maybe that's not the best way to approach religions, because religions are not supposed to make a serious, rigorous metaphysical claims. But if you want to construe religious claims as ontological claims, then we have to do metaphysics. I can't imagine any of the religions that I've ever heard of liking that. That's right. So that maybe we shouldn't take religious claims too seriously. But if we want to construe religious claims as claims about, uh, about the world or existence or ultimate reality, then it's unavoidable to do metaphysics. 
I'd love to put all religions under the microscope of metaphysics, examine religious ways of thinking and high claims about existence. My hunch would be that whatever commonality might emerge, call it ultimate reality or the real, would be short and simple, too short and too simple to be called religion. Not many theologians, I suspect, would like the project, demystifying their scriptures, traditions, rituals, downgrading their personal positions. So given these high stakes, how do Christian thinkers address the bruising diversity of religions? I speak with an Oxford-educated priest and thought leader of the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Dean of St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary, John Beer. The Christian tradition from the beginning has had a very universalizing horizon and claim and trajectory. Yeah? Origen in the third century put it very neatly. He said, in the light of the gospel, all things become as gospel. Okay? And what he was referring to was initially, at least, the way in which the writings of the Jewish tradition, the law, the Psalms, and the prophets, seen now from the perspective of Christ, all speak about Christ. And then from the middle of the second century, someone like Justin will in fact even go to someone like Plato and say, whatever good things he spoke actually are a reflection of the word of God and belong to us Christians. I doubt Plato would have agreed, but it's Justin's standing from this particular tradition, he can see seeds of the word, he called it, seeds of the word in all human affairs, and he could bring them all in. Whatever's good, whatever's noble, whatever's true, he can see as part of, part of the gospel in that way. Well, that basically says that I've got it all right, and other people have it partially right, so some of their partial right things I can incorporate oh, yeah. into mine. But, but, but other traditions don't necessarily do that. But the Christian tradition does that very clearly from the beginning. So standing within a particular tradition, one can then actually see universally from within it. What we learn today much more emphatically, however, would be the need to engage people within their own particular tradition on their own terms. And I think here it is helpful to not reduce to the lowest common denominator, but to understand the fullness of what they're trying to say from within. Okay? And so uh, the question would then be, what God are you talking about? That's when you then engage in a much more serious conversation mm -hmm. from the depth mm -hmm. of the tradition with each other. You wouldn't just presume we're all talking about the same, same thing. No, let me understand who your God is. Tell me about your God. And would it be the case that all of those are reflection of the same God, or would it be the case that w only one or more uh, of those are the real God and I the others are imposters? Could, I don't know how you could say that they're all different expressions of the same God, apart from by stepping out of a particular tradition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because within a particular tradition... It's very clear. <laughs> this is the one I worship. For sure. If I'm going to say, well, this is an expression, that's an expression, then I must be standing from somewhere else. Yes. Not in any particular tradition. Right. Well, then who's my God? So I don't think one can do that. John is resolute. Interreligious dialogue is good, but pluralistic equality is not. And while accepting other religions within an enlarged Christianity may feel to Christians ecumenical, it may feel to non-Christians arrogant. I applaud when religious leaders announce in public what many only whisper in private. Honesty may discomfort, but there is never truth without truth-telling. Structured truth in theology is expressed through systematic theology, a coherent, orderly setting forth of group doctrines and unified beliefs. How would a systematic theologian view religious diversity? I go to England to meet Sarah Coakley, professor of divinity at Cambridge and Anglican priest. It's a bad idea to think of religions as, as it were, large units with no 
complexity within themselves. The second thing I wanted to draw attention to is if you simply look at those clashes as, as it were, extrinsic doctrinal incompatibilities, then you're not really getting to the heart of the issue. You have to look at the practices and attitudes and lives that are attending these kinds of propositional assent. It seems to me that much more important is the question of how deeply we have imbibed our own traditions. That doesn't just mean by being fanatical, it means by how much we have actually absorbed and been transformed by the tradition that we've inherited. Now, once you begin to look at the relationship between religious traditions in those two different ways, then you've got a terrain that is much more interesting, I think, and also, you might say, more complicated. Are you saying that as you are more transformed uh, in your contemporary life, within your own tradition, then, then in that condition you are more receptive to other religions. I am, and I'm saying that... So that's a strong claim. It is a strong claim. Uh, I'm willing to stand by it. I think that the way that we have conducted our comparative religiosity in recent decades has by and large been rather misleading and very open to the natural riposte of the skeptic that all we have here is a cacophony of pluralistic voices that are incompatible with one another. Much more interesting is to draw together people of deep spiritual stature from different religions, put them in a room together and see what comes out of that. Because that's where I think the really interesting commonalities begin to emerge a deep commitment to peace, a deep commitment to mutual vulnerability and listening, a willingness to learn from the other. All of those things are wonderful for humanity, but all of those things undermine each of the traditions classical approach to God or the divinity of, of an individual or the, 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 the specialness of a prophet, all of those things disappear. This is only a preliminary to a discussion about truth that then emerges from that interaction. So in my, this is where I'm different from the sort of classic liberal pluralist ah. who is happy to say, well, isn't it wonderful that we have all these different traditions? Maybe they all have some kind of access to the truth and we should sit light to the fact of their uh, pluralism. That I'm not interested in that at all because it seems to me that the quest for unity in truth is overriding and that we can never get rid of that sense of quest, which is why I'm committed to one religion rather than another, because it satisfies me more than these others. And you believe there's a fundamental reality to that difference, not just that it makes you feel better. I do, absolutely. So, so really, then you do a two-step process. You say that, look, let's get together people of goodwill and of common spiritual quest together and, and be harmonious together. And then out of that, though, there's a second required step that those people you believe, you hope, will together discern some truth, in which case virtually everybody has to, will have to modify their beliefs uh, in, in order to accommodate that, uh, that project. They certainly will. And, but then if you remember my first point, which is that there is so much more complexity and also relative immaturity or relative maturity in the understanding of any one tradition, this becomes more attractive as, a, as an option. So the position neither subscribes to the absolutist presumption that one of these traditions holds the truth and the others don't, nor does it subscribe to the classic liberal pluralism that is often seen to be the only alternative to that. Do you then believe that all people will be saved in however you define the concept of salvation? I have a belief in a God who in my view, and this is a minority view within Christianity, doesn't give up on God's creation. And therefore I find it extremely hard to see that anyone is um, eternally set up for damnation. I respect Sarah's reaching out to other religions and personal confidence in her own. It seems an elegant compromise but then I frown. When it comes to ultimate reality, compromise makes me uneasy. But then again, is it compromise to argue? My God is the only God, but my God includes everyone, including those of other religions. 
If doctrine is not the heart of the issue, why then are doctrines so central to religion and their distinctions drawn so sharply? The claim of privileged access to God is not unique to Christianity. I meet a leading Islamic scholar of comparative religions, an authority on Muslim-Christian relations, Mahmoud Ayyub. There is disagreement among Muslims as to whether the uh, Quranic revelation and then the Islamic message uh, abrogates and supersedes all other previous religious traditions. The Quranic view, at least as I understand it, is that no, there is a plurality of religions in the world, but in essence, all religions really are meant to teach divine oneness. Religion, therefore, according to Islam, is basically all of its manifestations, a, in some ways, a manifestation of Islam as uh, being the uh, surrender of the human will to the divine will. In fact, according to Islam, we live in a Muslim universe. Not only human beings, but all creation is a creation that is a Muslim, that is to say, submitting to the will of God. So with that perspective, how do you deal with the multiplicity of religions in the world? Islam would argue that God reveals his will to every prophet in the language and the idiom and the culture uh, of that particular prophet. And even though, for instance, the Torah of Moses was revealed for, uh, to Moses and uh, through him to the ancient Hebrews, uh, it was binding on all those who knew about it until the coming of Jesus and the gospel. And then the gospel and the Torah had to be accepted until the coming of the Quran, and the Quran has to be accepted. What, Islam, what the Quran was calling for is a, an ecumenism of religious faiths. Uh, but Muslims actually did not go that way. Muslims instead said that where other religions contradict Islam, they have been tampered with, and uh, uh, where uh, they do not contradict Islam, Islam in any case supersedes uh, and abrogates them. I do not subscribe to this view. Uh, my view, and I'm not alone, uh, is that no religion abrogates another religion but that the religions are, in a way, uh, uh, different trees or flowers in a wonderful garden that we can all learn from. But still we have fundamental differences between these religions. And so how does Islam deal with the wisdom traditions which seemingly are very different in their portrayal of God? Why can't God speak? Uh, also Arabic as much as he does speak Hebrew and, and Greek. Regarding claims of ultimate truth, I know nothing for sure, save this. Every religion cannot be wholly true, but all religions can be deeply false. Three questions. One. Is there ultimate reality beyond the physical world? If no, religion is deeply false. If yes, go to questions two and three. Two, does ultimate reality have a personal God? Three, in what ways would religion reflect ultimate reality, if any would? Here are three options for religion. One, all religions reflect ultimate reality, 
And while differences among them may seem significant, these differences are culturally derived and thus not significant. Two, one religion has a special, closer relationship with ultimate reality. And while all religions may have some truth, only one religion has whole truth. Three, no religion reflects ultimate reality. And while some religions speak some truth, all religions are false or flawed. All religions, one religion, no religion, take your choice. Religion is crucial, coming closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.